Yeah, yeah. It's all about life lessons uh, this Wednesday. About life lessons. I'm um, Sabrina, says Georgie. I need to send me that song. I am dying. That is my grandfather. All on his own, dear Georgie. I'm not asking any questions at all. That is him. Um, Danilia says, good afternoon. I am dying at that song. Where did you find it? Is it a song? She asked if it's a song song. <laughs> it's not a song song. <laughs> it's just for that joke. Just for that joke. Yeah, and now it's time to put it aside. So we are moving forward on our life lessons today. It is going to be about moving forward. That's what it's going to be about. We have a super mom here, Shauna Case. And Shauna Case is a mother of three. And she's going to tell us about her journey. And, you know, the sort of, well, I don't know if I want to call it setbacks, you know, but she has been dealing with issues that were unexpected. And we want to learn from her. We want to understand how, you know, she managed and facilitated the lives of her children with all that has been happening or, you know, has been, is, was, all of them because it's happening as we speak. So lots to discuss here. And I'm so very, very happy that I get an opportunity to, you know, have you guys hear her story in her own words. Shauna, good afternoon. Thank you so very, very much for joining us. Hi, Georgia. Thanks so much for having me on your program. All right. So, Shauna, you are a mom. You have always wanted to be a mother. That was, you know, an intentional thing. Cause you know it go. You know, we know it go. <laughs> so Always. You know, like I grew up, um, I, you know, I wanted to, one means I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be this and that. But one thing, I was always sure that I was going to be a mother. You're always. I, I could never have pictured something else. Ah, oh. and so you're the type of hands-on mother. You always wanted to kind of be the mother that is in the life, mothering continuously. One hundred percent. I wanted to be there the, the entire way. I joke with my daughter, my eldest, that when she goes off to college, I'm moving in next door. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that's a joke. I mean, yeah, you like to think, but you're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you have three children, and the smallest, because the smallest is the, the one that kind of threw you the curveball. Yeah, yes. tell us about your children. All right, so um, I'll start with, with all three of them. So I have uh, an almost 14-year-old, a girl. Uh, my first um, child was a girl. I wanted a boy, but I got me a girl. So her name is Tyler Marie. Yes. Um, she's, she, I call her my daughter who mothers me. No. <laughs> like, she really is quite mature from she little till now. She really is mature. Um, and then my 11-year-old boy, you know, he's, little little mr genius like we don't know what he doesn't know and he's always he has always been so much older than his actual age so that's our little engineer and whatever else mm. um, yeah and then now our six-year-old um um a six-year-old marley marley case he's actually a little popular at, at the moment people know him online um through my Instagram page and Facebook and so forth. He was born with a very, very rare skin condition. Um, we call it, it is called epidermolysis bullosa. That, of course, is quite the mouthful. So we, we call it EB in the community, the EB community. We, we just say EB. Mm. Um, yes. So, so I mean, all right. So picture this. You're, you're, you're about to have your third child. So you feel like you're, you're experienced. Yes. So my third C-section. And I went in and I was only worried about myself in terms of um, for my second C-section, um, that was a very rough situation for me. So I went in, I had what, what seemed like a perfect pregnancy. Every time I went to the OB, um, I, I got good news. You know, the baby's moving well. Move, the baby moves a lot from the first appointment. You know, I did not know that, that what she picked up when she said he's moving a lot that it was actually an indication of EB. But of course, this is Jamaica. And, and the average, even across the world, it, it would be super difficult for you to know to test for a disease you never heard of. Yes. It's a condition. Because so, I was, when, when it was that you mentioned it, I had no idea what it was. Yeah, you have to be like, you go, you go Google, right? So, yeah. You have to Google it. They, according to Google, according to what I've read, one, about one in 50,000 people get this condition. And um, so, yeah, so basically I go have this, I did a C-section and, and, and um, I didn't know the sex of my child. I didn't know, we didn't want to know. And there was a festive mood in the theater. 
at um I, I had him at Jubilee and um we were all guessing there's like a bit going on for the sex of the child and then when he comes out he has this strong cry and I'm like, Yay, my baby crying loud, strong strong whatever I didn't know the boy girl and then the ship the mood just shifted in there. Mm. And that's the mood of the doctors, the nurses. Because yes. you wouldn't have known what is happening. I couldn't see him and I can't see what's going on. I'm so weak. Um, but and they're proud, you know, big cry. Um, and then they bring the baby to me and I'm like, I I think I said something. I was like, what is this? Like I pointed at him. I was like, what is this? I was just really shocked because I saw the beautiful baby, but um, his knuckles were raw looking and from his knee all the way down to his ankle. There was, for for what like there's no other way to say it other than there was no skin. Like I could see no skin from the knee all the way down. So I was like, what on earth? Like what is what is? I literally said, what is this? Um, so well, stop then, for a moment because you need to tell me what EB is because when it is that you're saying you're looking at your newborn baby and you know what a newborn baby looks like and them look strange as newborn overall, but you're saying that even as a newborn, it was strange for you that you know it seemed as if he had no skin. So what exactly is the condition, EB? All right. So so um, EB is um, epidermolysis bullosa is a condition a connective tissue disorder. So it means that the epiderm the epidermis is not connected to the dermis as it should be. There is a protein that is that connects both. So we wouldn't ever think about this because we are we have normal skin, and um, there's a protein that makes them work in tandem. But for for children, for people born with EB, the, that protein is lacking. So that means then that their skin is so fragile that when you touch to the touch, the the, the epidermis can shift. The skin can peel off and blister easily. So is it that he has no skin or he had no yeah, skin at that skin. point? He had skin. He had skin, but the, the, there, was a, 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 there were sections of his skin that, in, in my mind, was missing. Well, it was missing, it, um, I guess, in, 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 in birth while, it, while he came out. You know, some of the skin came off. Or I should actually say, um, studies say that um, it happens in utero. Mm. Wow. So it's like he was shedding his skin. And because of that, you know, the, the, what you're seeing was what we'd call like all roast raw flesh, that sort yes, of thing. It was like raw flesh. And shedding, shedding seemed more like more voluntary. Shedding would, wouldn't, wouldn't be as painful as what I think he goes, what he goes through. It has to, friction causes it to come off. Ah, so once you touch him or, any, or you get, you know, you might touch a wall or somewhere else, it causes it. it ah, so I fall for him, you know, all, all, all babies at some point, all kids have to fall. And so a fall for him would be more devastating than it would be for somebody else. Um, his skin was so sensitive that breastfeeding was a huge ch- challenge. So I actually didn't get to breastfeed him because um, skin is everywhere. It's our, lar- it's our largest organ, but it's both internal and external. So every single thing is coated with skin. So the challenges are, are innumerable. It's wow, because you would have to now rest him on your chest. But resting him on your chest might lead to his skin. Blistering mm-hmm. might lead to the sort of friction that would cause him pain. What should actually be causing him comfort? Mm-hmm. So it was it was such a daunting thing. It was such a daunting thing. But um, So this was like a big wrench. You know, our plans in a sense that, you know, I had um, two, two kids at home dying, you know, like excited that their their new siblings coming home and they don't know if it's a girl or boy either. And um, of course, because of his um, because of his condition, he had to stay in a hospital for two weeks longer. And, um, you know, for me to bring home a, a baby that is so different and then they, my, the, 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 bigger, the bigger siblings, they weren't allowed to touch him. I didn't allow anybody outside of Daddy and I to touch him for the first six months, like literally no one else. Well, before you even get to the first six months, because I'm just thinking about you in the hospital. I'm thinking about daddy in the hospital. Like, what did the doctors say? Did they immediately know what to do? Right. What was they, you know, getting used to period like for you for the next two or three days before right. you were even allowed to carry him home? Yes, right. So the, that first night, um, I didn't get any information until uh, until like midnight. I had him like when it was almost night, so maybe after six or something. And so after... 
after I asked the question, after he was born, they, they kind of wheeled him away from me. I didn't see, and, you know, I started crying. They needed me to calm down because, you know, how C-sections go, they, they, they have to finish up, and I needed to be calm. So I think they gave me sedatives or something because I remember you now being back up um, on the ward. And um, and I didn't have my baby. The other, the other moms on that ward would have gotten their babies that were born. So I was there sitting on the bed with a splitting headache and no baby to hold and, you know, freaking out because I don't know what is happening. And because it was Jubilee, um, daddy's not allowed to be there. Yes. Yes. Um, I feel like God actually told me to go to Jubilee because I was supposed to go to UAE. And I'm thankful that, that I didn't have the baby at you because they ended up choosing to put him in an in a in a what's the thing an incubator. Yes. You know everything you kind of have to pay for, and I mean, thankfully at Jubilee, you know, it's a free hospital. So praise the Lord for that. But yes, yeah, so now um, at some point, um, a, a doctor, a young doctor, came up to me and gave me the name of it. She told me what it is. She told me that there is only one doctor in the hospital who had seen the condition before and that um actually she gave me the the the, the, the name of it and i she didn't tell me the rest of this i heard this the 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 the, the, the diagnosis and what they thought about his chances after but um when she told me the name of it i couldn't even pronounce it you know like yes i, I, don't, I don't know what she's saying you know and um, I call my husband and I tell him, you know, and he, of course, he, he, you know, like this is a, a bomb drop for both of us. But he called me back really quickly and he said, Shana, Shana, promise me. He said, promise me to never do anything else. So I tell him, to promise me that you won't go online. And he said, turn off your data, don't go online. Because, and why was that? Because is it that he was saying, don't research it, don't find yes, out what don't it is? Research it, don't research yes. it. Yes. No, if you are to do an image search of EB, you will see some very, very gruesome photos. They're very, very gruesome. And that is how online searches are as well, you know. They give you the worst of the worst and you feel like you're going to die just because you see it overall <laughs> and they're convinced that, that is the end of the world. And everything he was trying to protect cancer. you. Yes. Everything is cancer or aneurysm or something. Yes, and yet tomorrow, tomorrow you expire. Tomorrow, so you know, get your things in order. That is what happens when you do an so, online so search. You're admitting that you're very guilty of the rules. Yes, you man. Know, yes, I searched you anything like that. I can understand <laughs> when it was that daddy gave you the call to say don't. It was, it was, I'm really thankful that he, he told me that because truth, truth is, I think I didn't look online for like a few weeks. Okay. I'm, I'm happy I didn't. So here's the thing now. So Why are you happy you didn't? Tell me. Why? Because that night I felt like my head was going to split. Yes, I can um, imagine. So they, 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 didn't, they couldn't give me information they didn't have. But at the same time, it was clearly a very, it was clear that it was a dire situation. And I remember sitting down on that bed, rocking myself, like crying. Ever, ever cry till your whole body a rocket? Yes. And my head feel like it will burst. And I heard God. At the time, I was not a baptized. I was not a Christian. Christian. I wasn't baptized yet. But at that time, I sit down on the bed and I hear God say, "Plain as they are here, be still and know." And that, they say, that that hold me. And I just kept repeating that. Be and, still and, and know. Be still and know that I am God. That and, and I am God. Yes. So wow. Yes. You know, they're telling me I have to run to a break. I am speaking to Shauna Case right here today. Super mom Shauna Case. She's talking to us about her journey with her children, you know, her final child in particular, who, you know, has just been diagnosed, she's saying, with a very rare skin condition, a skin condition that the doctors themselves weren't, you know, very aware of, that nurses weren't sure what to do, that persons were saying to her, having just had a C-section, that they're not sure of what the chances are, that her... Even her own husband had to call and said, don't research it because if you ever research it, you know, the things that you're going to see. And still she has to deal with this all. She has other children at home. When we get back, she's going to tell us how she moved forward. It's a life lesson right here on a Wednesday on the edge of 105. I tell you, 105.1 and 105.3 FM. My show is called Unfiltered. We give it to you as we get it. And today it's a life lesson. Thank you. 
We are talking to a super mom. That's what she's called. I'm telling you, a super mom, Shauna Case, you know, and she's carrying us with her through her journey. You know, she's talking about her third child. She has three children. And when we took the break, she was, you know, she had just delivered her child. She was sitting on her bed, crying to the extent that she could not be still, shaking back and forth. And then she said she heard the voice as clear as day be still and know and she needed that voice because she had just received devastating news about her third born child now we're going to hear what happened next he's in the hospital he has eb not even the doctors are sure what it is they're not sure if he's gonna live she's not sure if he's gonna live her husband was so horrified by what he saw online he called he begged her don't research it she's dealing with all that and still she had to move forward how did she do it we're going to find out right now shauna welcome back to our show so shauna the hospital you're in the hospital how long did the babe stay in the hospital the the hospital the baby was in the hospital for hospital for two weeks um i was in there for was it i think i was there for five days three three or five days you know i don't remember that no i just know that when i had to leave it was beyond heartbreaking and i couldn't manage it but i want to backtrack a little bit to the night the same night um when he was born right two things um after god settled me a little you know with saying you know be still and know um i was about to say why me i was about to say right i was about to say why me I ended up saying, why not me? Mm. I, I didn't consciously say, why not me? So it may no say the Holy Spirit did a work in me before me even did understand these things. So I was like, why not me? And and there's this fierceness that came into me. This, this I didn't even know I had that level of faith. But this defiance that not, I don't care what anybody else coming to me to say, my child is going to live, my child is going to be fine, whatever this EB business is. We're going to figure it out and conquer it. So I said, why not me? I would not want anybody else to, to go through this, to be very honest. And I'm very sad that other children have it. Wow. And so now you're steeled, you know, right now. They talk, they talk about that, you know. They talk about a mother. And when it is that her mother's child is in danger, how internally she steals herself. And, you know, fiercely now she is ready to protect her child. They say, oh, the only mothers can explain it, they say. Yeah. <laughs> that, they, they, that when it is time to fight or, you know, for fight or flight, that mothers, once it is your child is in danger, you're always ready to fight. And so right there in the midst of the storm, you were ready to fight for your child. I went from, from, from bawling hysterically and having no control over anything to just having this, this quiet defiance. defiance. And another thing too, right, my husband, when, when, the, when the doctor had come up and um, told me the name of the condition, she also said that there would be an ointment that the child needs, that uh, Miley needs, that is not at the hospital and that we need to get it. So, of course, when I call my husband back now, I'm like, listen, they say that they need bacitracin and give him the name of it and I tell him they need it. And I'm like, go now, they don't have it. And, you know, as as far as I'm concerned, he needs it now to live. Yes. So, so like, I think my husband took like 35 minutes to get to the hospital with it. And when he came with it, um, I think he brought like two or three tubes of it in the brown bag. And, and then I summoned for the doctor and they're like, what? The doctor gone home, like, why, why you kill up yourself to get this? And I'm like, what do you mean by why I kill up myself to get this? <laughs> you know, because how else is going to live? <laughs> yes. We need, reach, we need to reach the moon tonight. We're going to reach the moon tonight. This is our baby. Yeah, so, yeah. So together. So, so it is not just you now. It's not just me, right? It's as parents on the side. Yes. So we're fighting this come what may. Yes. And I mean, God is so intentional because he really knows what he's doing when he tears two people who are to be together together. Because I miss bubbly, soft, um, you know, a chatty, fun going kind of a girl. And he is completely the opposite. He he is. I've always said he's my rock. Mm. He's um, not 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 the skin teeth kind of person. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> um, very intense and very focused. So focused, always has a plan. I, I don't have no plan. I just get up and say, oh, oh. God with the wind. <laughs> yes, I no, yeah, just yes. leave. <laughs> <laughs> right. ah. So, you know, months later, I had asked him, like, after after I called him, like, seriously, how did that, that go? And he said, you know, honestly, Shauna, 
You say, honestly, I did have 15 minutes of my doubt. But after 15 minutes of my doubt, I was, and, then, and, then I, and then I just sprung into action. And I'm like, what do you mean? And then everything became clear because, you see, the baby is born this day and I'm is a C-section, so, you know, I can't really move around. So for two days, I didn't see the baby. He got to see the baby several times. But mm. um, the, that on the, the second day, when the, the, after the two days passed and I got to finally go down to the NICU, um, he gave me this sick document, like 40-odd pages, um, two of them, one for him and one he said needed to stay there. And he said, Shana, please talk to these doctors. Uh, and I don't know if they're going to feel a way that I go bring in my research, but I really need them to read this. So I said, okay, fine. And we talked to the doctor and... Um, and we, we said it to her, to the, to the head doctor at the time, and she, she took it and she said thanks. And the next day... When no, but hold on, man. You can't skim over that. You're saying that daddy, he once it is that he got in two days later, he went home, he did such this sort of research that he could have prepared his full document, yeah. that he could go to the doctors and the nurses who, you know, before they didn't have the knowledge so that they could do what they need to do, that he could now go to them and say, hey, this is what I have a 45 page document bound ready. Like, listen, this is my child. Cha- hey. Right. So he had it printed and he contacted whoever abroad to hear, like, what, because um, there's an organization abroad that, that really helps and it's been a lifeline for us. So he got all of that done. <laughs> he, was, he was not wasting time. Hey, no man, you have to stop and give him name and big him up right. I mean, like, oh, yeah, glass yeah. over. The, oh, the yeah. big man sat out. That by the time you get up two days later, the Omar. man ready. <laughs> Omar, is it, it, when people say super mom, I'm like, hmm, it's because I have my super dad. Yes. Omar, champion daddy. Everybody know that. He's quiet, but he is a force to be reckoned with. And I'm so grateful to him. And... When I did go back, I could see evidence of highlights all over the document and the treatment for him changed. So So the nurses and the doctors, they didn't think that they were too big for this. They literally took this document, they went through and they found it useful. Yes, they did. Because, you know, when I first got down there to the NICU, you know, the the doctor was telling me um, that the prognosis is very bad and that I need to speak to a grief counsellor. And I nearly lost my... I don't want to say the wrong yes, thing. Yes, everything. And here they lost everything because he's yes. saying that, you know, it is over. But mm-hmm. your husband know that it's not over mm-hmm. till it's over. Yes. Hey, we don't um, talk about daddy, you know, man. We don't <laughs> talk about, I tell people, you know, that it's important for a woman to have a man. Yeah? A man. A man. I, I am in love with that part of the story. I am in love with the fact that in the, in the two days, him find the people that are foreign and the group where he must contact and him find him information and him print it out and him carry it to the doctor. That's them can highlight things and know what, hey, where's his name? Mario, <laughs> Mario Mary Case. Mario Case. Mar- oh, no, Omari. Omari Case. Omari Case, yes. sir. So, you have a feel good story today, tomorrow, the day after. Oh, my case. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. You know, if it is that you're listening to our story today, 3831166, send us a message. What do you have to say, you know, to Shauna Case, to Amari Case? 9069559 is our number. Here it is. They're steering into the unknown. Some persons would say the abyss. Yeah, a doctor is saying you need a grief counseling. It don't look good. It not going to sort out. But daddy knew better. And mommy could feel it inside that better must come. Mm-hmm. We're talking to the super parents today, yeah, because not just the super mom. She says she's super because she had a rock. I love yes. it, I love it, I love it. So <laughs> now you are going home. You're going home without your baby. What did they say to you? Um, well, uh, well, here's the thing. The first two weeks, it was um, a lot of tr- um, training because they had to learn and they had to pass that knowledge on to me. So very quickly... I got involved in the care of Marley, even though, can I tell you, I was terrified because just I did not want to be the one to make a mistake. Um, it was evident that, like, you could see, oh, I just seen the picture of this. I could see there are some prints on his chest. So, like, somebody would have, like, lift him up wrong. And uh, you know what? Just like our big up, Omari, I have to big up um, the matron, the head matron that was there. I think her name was Nurse William. I hope I'm right. Um, if I'm wrong, oops. Um, but yeah, nurse, the, the, the head nurse that was there, she had suggested quite earlier on that um, that we treat Marley like a like a burn victim, mm. and that 
crucial as well because the, the one doctor that had seen the EB before, the one that um, told me about the bad prognosis, told me the one case she saw before he died, so they are expecting Marley to die. And um, when I was about to fly up on her in there, because I was raised well, but you know. Yes, sad with everything, yes. <laughs> yeah. And then she was saying to Amara, you know, oh, you said she nice, you said she, she has sense and things. And then he's like, yeah, but you're there telling her that her child won't die. And, and, and then, you know, I watch Grey's Anatomy and I watch whatever medical show you want to hear me. I'm like, so, so, um, are his vitals okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So like if he's breathing, listen, if he's breathing and his heart is working, don't tell me no no, no, no bad prognosis, right? So anyways, um let me stop acting like some bad woman. Yes, um, yes, and I can so, understand the need to fight for your child. The fight for his life, I can understand. But I tell you, and that matron who understood what you were feeling, and they tell you, you know, they say, listen, an experienced nurse is one of the best things that can happen to you in life. They, they tell you all the time. An experienced nurse. Oh, mm-hmm. wonderful. So now they're treating him like a burn victim. It's a lot of trial and error. Everybody's trying to get it right. Every time you see him, you can see every mistake that is made. Yeah. And but now you're saying you have to go home. After the, the, after the documents, a lot of the mistakes did cut down. They, um, they, they, they turned the, the incubator off. They kept him in the incubator, but they turned it off because he didn't need any like life support, I think. And they started teaching me how to bathe him. And I was terrified because the the um the nurse was saying to me that you know, um, mommy, you're going to have to be um super detailed and super careful, and you have to clean down the place every day. With the woman go as far as to tell me that I going to, have to clean my walls with bleach, bleach, you know. And I'm like, God, really me? me? Yes, yes. So you will never know, mommy, clean anything. <laughs> no, you have to be cleaning no, your walls like, with bleach. Of, yes, and I'm like, I was terrified. I'm like, okay, well, Lord, if this is my cross to bear, me I go bear it. Um, but um, one of the things that they told me during um, before I left and while I was there is that we have to handle him with gloves. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that was recommended in the document that Omari had printed. However, we both decided um, we were vehement that we're, we're not going to use gloves to handle our baby. Why so, was that? Talk to me. I mean, right, right. So that's what I want to talk to all mothers with, right? Um, babies. Actually, not babies. Everyone who's anyone who is in the hospital, and I mean, obviously the nurses have to follow protocol. But when you have your own child, whatever the ailment, the child needs as much care and love and warmth as possible. So I just thought about it, like touching my child with gloves. I that though I cannot transmit. I can't give him the love that I want to give him through no gloves. I rather wash my hands a million times per day. And but I'm sure that he has the healing touch of a mother. Actually, I want to touch. I want you to feel my warmth. I want. I want to communicate my love through my fingertips. And 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 um, it's funny because some weeks after I'm going to jump forward a little bit. I remember reading when I got comfortable to look at stuff online and saw that there is actually a Facebook community of people with ED. There was a father who who had said, oh gosh, he had said that his. He just got to feel his 11-year-old, 11-year-old daughter's um, skin on him for the first time in 11 years, and this is because she died. Oh no! And I was like, "What? Oh and no! Things are no not to touch my picnic. Yeah, and no. That, oh lord, that's so and, um, sad. Yes, that was that was heavy. That was a heavy day, and we're like, Mm-mm, "That's not going to be our story." So um, th- there's that, right? So when you when you have a child that is ill. You have to, the, as much as you can touch them, even if it's not to do something just to touch them. There are times when I just gently rub my hand on his back or touch his forehead or caress his face because I have to communicate love as much as I can do that. So as much as you can do that, mommy, is anybody who need to hear this, do that. As and much as you can communicate love. As much as you can. Because now, they- you know, you're looking back now, Shauna, and what happened and, you know, the days. But six years have passed. Yes. Six years have passed. What have those six years been like? What was the first year like in comparison to now when it is, I guess you're a veteran in the business? Uh, I guess so. Yes. Um, um, all right. So the first year, of course, came with its challenges, but, you know, triumphs as well, because as much as he is this very delicate child, he is a baby. He's a regular baby with the same needs as everybody else. So after getting over my disappointment in not being able to to breastfeed him, 
I realized that I'd have to, uh, I committed to, to bottle feeding him. And the thing too with bottle feeding him, because even to this day, he's six years old and I do still feed him from a nipple bottle. How that works is um, he, he cannot suck. He, his, tongue, he, his tongue would be too sensitive to actually, the sucking motion is um, really delayed with him. And, um, and I, I don't want to say it's impossible because I don't believe in that type of talking, but it's very difficult for him. So what I had to do was cut a bigger hole in the nipple bottle and drip feed him. So that, that first year, you know, it was a lot of uncomfortable bottle feeding because you have to hold him a certain way. He has to be propped up on pillows. And we, we got, um, I think the nurse, the nurse, that same, the head nurse had suggested what she calls um, egg crate to us. It's a soft spongy thing. I actually don't know what the real practical use of it is, but um, my hubby went and, and bought like some special sponges. And so he would, for the first year, be um, propped up on a sponge because as soft as our bed is, we needed something softer. Wow. And, right, so we had to prop him up and we had to drip feed him. And the drip feeding thing, go on for a very, to be very honest, Marley started comfortably eating solid food this year. At age six? At age six. So all this while, um, he's been being fed um, um, smoothies. So I've had to, I tell you, you know, like I give him as, like, um, like sweet potato. I, I put as much, as many different ingredients as I can. I, I make up all sorts of smoothies because I want to make sure he gets as much. New trends as possible. Yeah, new, so yeah. you have become a whole new mother. You know, things that we would never think about. You know, how to make sweet potato smoothie and all of those things. You, Those things you have, you know, really kind of attacked with fervor. You are like, all right, I'm going to ensure that my son has the best life possible. You're right, because you see, I noticed that the other kids in the first world countries with EB, what, 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 what's popular is a, a majority of them um, have to... Uh, they are encouraged to use what we call a G-tube. So they attach this apparatus to their belly buttons and they're fed through it. And I refuse that. Like, I literally refuse to feed my child through a tube. I understand why they do it, but I, if my hand goes broke off, then so be it. I will, I will feed him liquid for as long as possible. But of course, you know, I pray to God, look, God do make the pit me eat. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, at first, I tell you, I t talk about the milestones. By the way, if it is that you're just joining us, where have you been? We're talking up to this phenomenal woman. We're actually moving forward with her. It's a life lesson on a Wednesday. And this Wednesday, we are doing a moving forward. Yeah, where we're moving from that point of uncertainty, that point of, you know, sorrow, really, of shock when it is that you hear, you know, one of the worst things that a mother could hear, that they're saying, hey, your son more than likely won't make it that they're saying this condition not even we understand it yeah one person ever see it where persons are saying to you i don't know what to do and we're moving away from that we're moving forward into i am going to take care of my child i am going to make these decisions we are going to do our research i am going to love him through my touch she says he should feel the love through my fingertips all of those things she moved through and now six years later she is living her life as a mother not a mother of one but a mother of three and so that leads me to my my second question or another big question for me how has that impacted the lives of the other children and your relationship i mean how do they interact do they get that opportunity yes they do now um so i had uh, mentioned it a little bit before so yes so um they were so excited that you know um, a new sibling was coming and um one of my worst memories in life is going back home the day that I went back home without a baby in my hand. I couldn't. I stood underneath the mango tree. I have a nice East Indian mango tree where I used to live. Um, and it took a lot to get me to move from the mango tree inside because my husband had told them that something is different. I don't know what his wording was, but he didn't want to scare them. So they didn't have a full story of what was going on with the baby. And and generally explaining emotional type things is my is my my mantle. I do. Yes, yes. So that's your terms of the gender roles and things at the house. That are your thing. Right. Yeah. So um, the good thing is because I believe I, I think I can um, credit this to homeschooling because I've ho I had home homeschooled them for a couple of years by then, and um, we have this policy of 
of basically being unfiltered. Unfiltered, um, of course, in an appropriate way. Like any question that they, they ask me, I vow to them that once they ask me a question, I will answer it. So I, I went in there and I spoke to them and I, and I gave it to them. I told them what the situation was, but of course, um, you know, affirming that he is going to be okay and, you know, that we're going to pray him up and everything. So how it impacts them now, though, is they just have a sensitivity and a level of maturity that I think is unnatural. And sometimes I have to remind myself, oh my gosh, these, these kids, they the 14 year old wants to do a 14 year old thing and you know like the, the my, my now 11 year old i think when he was like six or seven he seemed like a 10 year old the whole time so he was super mature but you know of course i had i made it clear that they can come and talk to me tell me when they're sad tell me when they have questions and i made sure that they would get their time outside of the house like go out to to auntie go out to to do the extracurriculars as much as I, um, you know, I, they, for the first six months, they weren't allowed to touch him and that was tough for them. I made them involved still. I made them go fetch stuff. I made them sing to him. I made them, I made them involved until, you know, it was safe enough for me to, because I'm, I'm sure it was safe much earlier, but you know. But yes, <laughs> but you're a mother and you're trying to protect and you're making sure. Right. Somebody says, Georgia, what's her name? Her name is Rush. Um, her, sorry, I'm, le- I'm reading Shana, from Rochelle. Shana. Her name is Shauna Case. Rochelle is asking what's her name. She says, Georgia, she is so light with all that she is facing. She sounds so light on the radio. I don't know how that is possible. Light is the word. That's a, that's a new word. But it is so appropriate. Light. You sound light on the radio. Not, you know, burdened down. Yeah, because you are happy with your family and the life that you're living and you're doing. You say that God is intentional. So what Mm -hmm. God intended. Boy, Um, Michaela says such an inspiration. Praying for the Case family. Praying that Faith's family continues to be an inspiration, not just to those of us who know them, but to all Jamaicans, to the EB family, the EB community and to parents everywhere. Let me go one more. Sissy says, Georgia. Sometimes you hear parents say they can't bother. You need to hear parents say they can't manage. They need to listen to this young lady. She Aww. is wonderful. And the man that she has, and his name Omari. I'm beginning him up and I want to remember everybody going to put some respect on his name. <laughs> Omari Case um. is his name. Sahai says, Omari Case, big up your proper, proper self, Papa. Big up your him. proper, proper self. I'm having a message here from John, from Hanover. John, I'm going to have it you know played a little bit later on now you know talk to us about your child you know is he able to walk now what what is he doing now and where do you expect that he would go what what are your plans what are my plans um um okay so he he's walking now it took him he walked unassisted right before his third birthday i prayed hard about it hard about it and god answered just in the nick of time. I think he probably walks on the 9th of April and his birthday is on the 10th. And so that's, that's just incredible because I'd been praying about it for a while and then I was like, oh gosh, God, God, no, God, no, give me this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, he's walking. Um, there are days when he'll have a tough time and then we'll have to say, sorry, Marley, you have to sit down today. You have to lie down in the couch today, which which he doesn't like because Mr. Marley is a very independent child. Yes. Uh, so um, he, he uh, so for example, one of the one of the drawbacks of EB is um, the kind of EB that he has, his, his digit fused. So when I say his digits, his toes fused and his fingers fused, but they're fused together. And the thumb, the thumb, his both on both hands, his thumbs are free, and then the other four fingers are fused, right? And we saw it fusing, and I tried to prevent it and tried to wrap in between. Because here's the thing that I haven't spoken much about is that we have to wrap him, we have to keep him bandaged at all times. And and, his and that is from head to foot. You have to keep him bandaged yes, from head to head. foot at all times. Uh, yes, from yes, his whole torso is bandaged, his legs, feet, hands bandage so he only gets um some freedom from the neck up um so 
um, with his fingers now, his fingers fusing, I wanted to bandage in between his fingers. We tried, but he would always exhibit such discomfort. He'd always do it. And I, I couldn't stand to... To, to see him in pain. Him. Yes. yes. It looked intense. So his fingers have fused, and um, we're actually looking into um, possible surgery for him later on. We were talking about it with a surgeon here and going abroad and all that. Um, but so Mr. Marley now, speaking about how independent he is, he sees his brother and sister writing and drawing and doing all these things, and he's not to be left behind. So being a homeschooler, what I've noticed um, is that of all the different topics to teach, I, I do not find handwriting to be fun at all. I don't. I think my patience kind of stops there. Yes. When, when it came to teaching Marley writing, I had no intentions of teaching Marley to write. I honestly was going to just teach him how to type and, and call it a day. But homeboy wants to learn to write and homeboy can write his name and homeboy loves to write and, and draw and paint. And he makes it work with those curved fingers. Oh, Lordy. You know, he finds his own way to do his own thing. He is his father's child, defiant and a rock. And then and then he is like, you see, you guys said, I, somebody said, I'm light. You would not say that. If you, well, not that you wouldn't say that, but Marley's light is so illuminating. Yeah. You're saying this that. Child is always smiling. Oh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. You said this child is always smiling, bandaged from head to foot, fingers fused together, not able to be up and down and around, and still the yes. smile, you know, is always there. The lights up the home, lights up your life. You say Marley's yeah. always smiling. But I kid you not, I have friends who will be having like a tough day at work, in their carpet job, whatever the case is, and they'll call me and say they just want to talk to Marley. They just want to talk to Marley. Talk to Marley for five minutes and they're good. Because when you're around somebody like Marley, it, it kind of teaches you not to complain. Mm. And, you know, to shift your perspective to one of gratitude because he'll go from, from intense pain and bawling to, to this grinning and this happiness. And like, he'll say, he'll like, mommy, I'm okay. You know, I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Like, and I'm like, you just went through that though. And he'll, He'll comfort me. And he'll comfort you. He'll comfort me. Why, oh boy. You know, and you know, they're telling me that I have to wrap up, and I don't want to, but I have to. I'm looking at the time. I can't believe we've been talking so long. But what are the big lessons that you have learned going through this journey? Lots more to go through. You know, he has not yet become a teenager, that sort of thing. Going through. Talk to me. What are um, the big, big lessons? Big lessons um, from a parenting perspective is be your child's biggest influence like take a front take take go in the driver's seat um so even if you send them to school whatever the case is be your child's biggest influence because guess what it's 2020 and they will be influenced so you better make sure that you are a strong force there no when i was growing up i used to hear oh don't brainwash your kids blah 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 these things i don't know that we we have the luxury of not taking a firmer stance as a parent. So in whatever the situation is, just be your child's biggest influence because everything is out to get them. Not in a doom and gloom kind of way, but just be there so that they're not afraid to come to you about anything. You should be their first point of contact. And you guys, you know, whatever the questions are that they have, go research it with them. That's one thing. What else can I say? Um, And, um, just, you know, as you, like I was saying before about love, that take every opportunity you can to show them love. Because you know what, like my, my, my 11-year-old Caleb, um, Caleb is, uh, is still a lot like Marley in terms of lovey-dovey, Mr. Loverman, love come and hug up and kiss and something. But I already see where eh, there's a hesitation to, to trip for me and them thing there. Because so, him know, think he's a ton big man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... So it we time really does fly. So hug them up and kiss them and, and read to them and just do as much as you can do with them. And the thing is, you know, like don't don't look at another person's life and because and, you know things on, on um on online and social media is curated, you're only to the the highlights. Yes. And you compare, right? Yes. You don't do that because if your if your reality is that you live in a board house or whatever it is, whatever you are doing, rope your child in with you. 
we we farm now with oh right so one one other thing i should um joke in is um you had asked about milestones since man was born we we used to live in kingston right? yes that's where we make money that's where hobby makes most of his money and all those things but we chose we had to choose to move to mandeville because mandeville is a cooler cooler parish and and oh. the in kingston was really devastating his skin oh, so, okay yes yeah. and so your life changed overall well, yes, I hold because I used to I used to produce um, documentaries and commercials. You know, I was in the film industry a little, and I love that and I miss that. But you you have to put on your big girl panties and do what life needs you to do. And I tell you, as you say that, you have to do what you need to do, you know, because it is as it is. Latoya sent us a message. Latoya says, Georgia, I am listening to this woman on your show and I need to get up and walk around to how she has touched me. I've been having problems with my teenager. I am on the brink of giving up on him. But when I hear this lady who gets up every day and wraps her son from head to toe and she is still here talking about all she she's going to be doing and how she's loving him i cry shame of myself for thinking of giving up on mine that is coming from latoya and latoya is in kingston i'm um, treasure is in mandeville she says good day georgia i am here listening and i just want to say to mrs case continue to do what you're doing and loving your children you're an inspiration for all of us who believe we have these problems with our children from one mother to another mother god is is always in control. That is what Trisha Sissy says. Georgia, applause for this lady. Applause, applause, applause. Tony says, big up the big man too. We did big him up, Tony. We had all Tony said, big up the big man too. Karen says, good afternoon, Georgia. I am so loving I'm so loving what is happening here. In spite of the storm, she is standing steady. Shauna Case, super mom, super parents, wonderful family, Mali, the light that shines. Mali, oh, we love you all. We want to thank you for sharing with us here today, for being a part of our show, for being the inspiration that you are. We pray God's richest blessing. We pray your strength in times of adversity that we know will come. But you have what it takes, uh, you know, with your rock to push through. Thank you. Thank you Can so I very much. Word? Of course. A final word to Latoya and all the other moms and dads out there. God wants to help you parent. If you try to parent on your own, but like just don't do that. Give it to him. He, I, I don't have any wisdom on my own. He literally tells me things. I'll be taking a shower and he'll whisper something to me and I'll research it. And, oh, that's good for your skin and all those things. But I'm just saying, you have to lean on God because... We are stewarding, we are stewards of our children. They, they kind of aren't really ours, they're his anyway. So, so, so just lean on him, lean on him in parenting. We need God more than anything in all areas of our life, but in parenting is God. Indeed, indeed. With that, with that, I run. Such as we tell him, it's not my time anymore, but I love it. Shauna Case, moving well, forward today, what a life lesson. What a life lesson on a Wednesday. That's what you find right here on our program. The best of Jamaica. The best of Jamaica. you find it right here on Unfiltered. Uh, the Edge 105.1 and 105.3 FM.